Richard Morgan and over the next 20 minutes or so we're going to explore what it's like to be hit by a cyber attack. Over the last number of years I found myself in my role as a business journalist talking more and more about personal data and cyber attacks. Huge global companies have been victims of such breaches with personal information of millions of people stolen by criminals. This data is becoming ever more valuable and with the right information, these hackers can access our lives in ways we'd never have imagined. And as the pandemic took hold, there has been a marked increase in people and businesses being targeted. That's what we're here to talk about today. Special EU Programmes Body is a cross-border organisation which manages two EU funding programmes with a value of around 580 million euros. It has funded 132 projects with over 400 organisations in almost every sector. And over the summer, it was affected by a cyber event, a crisis which could be potentially catastrophic for any organisation out there. And over the next while, we'll explore what's come from this and the importance of leadership. Gina McIntyre is the organisation's CEO. And Gina, thanks for being with us today. I can't imagine getting that call myself. Just take us through what happened. Thank you. Uh, yes, 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 it's 1am Sunday morning and I got a text from our IT manager to say we've got a problem and we, we had no idea the extent of the problem but he said it was bad and the bizarre thing was that I was actually up at that time because we were reading an article in the Irish Times um, written by a, a TV in Kilgenny saying that during Covid Irish organisations and businesses needed to be prepared to be attacked uh, you know, with cyber attacks um, so I got this text and I thought, this is really bizarre. Um, so I explored a little bit with him and I, I think initially, when you're first told that, there's a bit of denial because you think this can't be happening, you know, we are compliant, we have all our we have traditional IT architecture, but we have the appropriate IT security, baseline, cyber threat, you know, everything in place. We had our virus, uh, antivirus software, we had our firewalls. Well, so I thought, this, this can't be happening. Surely it's not going to be as bad as it sounds. Um, and then you realise it is. And uh, it, is, it, it was you know, all across all our internal systems. We were very fortunate. It hadn't affected any of our project data. Uh, and that was a real blessing that sat on a separate server. So we're, you know, we were actually in the process of moving to the next stage of cyber um, security. And it was just bad timing. Covid hit. We went out, and it hadn't. It wasn't a priority for those couple of months. So I think what happens then is you go into protection mode, and sort of the, you know the crisis reaction kicks in, and you think, right, what do we have to do? It my massive team of two were busy um, cutting all connections where they could, you know, and uh, stopping the, the the damage uh, to go any further um, over the you know over a line. Um, I, I was thinking, well, what do we do for business? We couldn't let any of our staff log in. So because of COVID, we had all our team, all our whole organisation on WhatsApp. So we were able to get a message out at 2am that don't log on, don't let anybody log on to try to access the office um, systems. As a precaution as well, I mean, it was very unlikely it would happen, but just as a precaution, we decided to freeze bank accounts. Um, and, you know, just to, to make sure we could do anything we could in those early hours. Uh, obviously, we couldn't freeze the bank accounts at that time, but, you know, that was priority for the morning and to make sure that everybody was um, put off the system and that we invoked our business continuity plan. Did you, know, did you ever imagine that you would have to deal with the situation like this? And I mean, how were you feeling when you know, the ransom notes arrived? Yeah. I mean, there must have been so much going through your head. Uh, no, I never thought. Uh, I always thought that uh, the results of the referendum, the UK referendum, the EU, was going to be the biggest thing that our organisation could face. Um, and this was absolutely just horrific um, to realise that not only was it that your systems were down, but it was actually done deliberately. Um, and so you don't know with a ransomware, you know, you're not sure what is happening, what's still going on within your systems. You don't know what they've done, you don't know what they've taken. You know, there's a bit of uh, suspicion. Are they watching me still? You know, are they still there? Um, are, am I going to get a call from them to say, right, we have your data, here it is. That's not what the note was. But, um, you know, it, you, you just, it, all that goes on in your head because you've never faced anything like this before. And no, you know, I've never faced anything like this. 
um, and uh, it is a criminal activity and that's the bottom line. So you do become, in effect, a victim of that and, and I'm sure that's the feelings that all victims would have um, when they're faced with a ransom note for their data. Um, luckily that, that never came to pass. Um, but uh, we had a cyber expert who was an ex-colleague of ours and we were able to contact him very quickly in the morning and uh, he was able to put us, you know, all the initial contact names and numbers that we needed um, to deal with this ransomware. But uh, it is, it's a very unsettling experience. The ransomware, extremely unsettling. It's not just your systems, it's also this added threat um, and it's not, it's not pleasant. And as part of the response, Gina, you brought in PwC and Ronan McGee is with us. He led the team that was brought in. And Ronan, I suppose the first thing you say to people when you get these types of calls is do not pay the ransom. But I mean, where do you start in terms of responding to something like this? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, well, I, I, I remember the call that I received uh, uh, came through from a from a new number, and immediately you're thinking it's going to be uh, some kind of PPA call. But when you answer it uh, and you hear a local accent, and the individual saying, I, "I think we've been hit with some form of cyber attack or some kind of breach," then you know your your ears immediately pick up, and and you start going into um, a state of trying to establish the facts, establish what. Do you know to date why do you think it's a cyber attack? Talk me through how you've responded to date. And attacks happen in many different ways. You have external threat actors and you have insider threats. And you have to be you have to be mindful of that because how you react in those situations can be be very different. Um, I remember during that initial call um, when when I was told they believed it was an external actor, I, I'd asked. Have you have you severed ties with the outside world? Have you have you stopped um, the opportunity for the for the hackers to be still accessing your systems? And, and I was told that, that had happened. So that that's one of the immediate things that you you need to consider. Um, you need to also find out a little bit more about the organisation themselves, the structure. Gina already alluded to the fact that there's two IT um, members uh, in the team as well as having to deal with the complexities and difficulties with managing the organization's IT uh, infrastructure, remote working capabilities throughout COVID, etc., they now have the added pressure of trying to respond to um, some kind of cyber attack. Um, and and that, that creates a lot of pressure. So you need to ask the, the organization, well, what support do you need? And, and try and um, make sure that you're able to respond adequately and appropriately. And as I say, in this COVID world, that, that may mean that you might have to deploy a team on site and, and that can be difficult too um, you know with with people self-isolating um, indeed with the organization um, or operating remotely they may not have the staff um, available uh, on site um, and then the, the challenges that go with that trying to um, remotely connect to a network that has already been cut off and isolated from the internet is exceptionally difficult. So um, it, it does become a, a challenging situation and you have to establish those facts. In relation to, to, to you mentioned about, about paying a, a ransom note, um, that, that that is definitely one of the areas you know, we would recommend you, you don't do that. You're um, helping the, the criminals, you're incentivizing them and the more um, uh, organizations, individuals that pay uh, the ransom then, the, the more the uh, attackers feel incentivized and motivated to continue um, with their attacks. Ronan, if I can just pick up a bit more on COVID because it affects everyone, every organization at the moment. Do you find that some organizations will be more vulnerable at the moment because of COVID because of how we're all working from home using equipment that uh, maybe isn't from the office? I, I think that's a fair comment, Richard. Um, and, and COVID came on us very quickly and in trying to respond to it, um, business processes had to adapt quite, quite quickly um, to allow remote working. In some instances, that may um, involve purchasing um, non-standard laptop computers from some high street stores and giving them to um, the team and allowing them to connect into your network. And in other instances, uh, the IT team may decide to um, change some of the configurations and parameters which uh, allow remote networking, remote connections into the office, which under normal circumstances wouldn't be permitted. But in a COVID world, it's deemed uh, a suitable workaround. So you, you, 
there, there is that um, complexity and there's that challenge with working remotely. But I also think with working remotely and having lots more video calls, video conferences, and I must say I've used about five, six, seven different types of platforms um, for those communications, the attackers are smart and they will um, look and seek to attack the weakest um, link in your chain, which tends to be the members of your staff who, if they receive a request in to join a meeting, um, they will often, the attackers will often try and replicate a valid um, request to join a meeting, um, but send it off to some kind of spurious server um, to try and trick you into joining and downloading an application, which would give them remote access to your systems. Let's bring Gina back in. Gina, you know, PwC on side now, you were dealing with this crisis, you were also managing your team. And did you know at this point what you needed, the steps you needed to go through? Yeah, we, you know, we, we invoked our business continuity plan uh, immediately in our communications crisis plan, and we had an IT recovery plan. So we had the plans, but I would warn anybody um, to think about those plans very carefully because we had them, but you know, we had carried out tabletop exercises of business continuity plans when we were all in the office and all meeting at the same time. Try doing that when COVID, you don't have people in the office, your IT managers in Kerry, your corporate services directors in Donegal with no signal, um, and you're trying to bring people together to deal with communications issues. Um, because, you know, you can test these plans when you're all together, but I, I would really advise people to test them randomly. Um, during COVID and during holiday times, because like when, a fire drill. yeah, absolutely, because um, you know a business continuity plan will only work whenever you're in a crisis, uh, and then you really see how it works. And even some simple things like the length of your business continuity plan, you want to make sure that that's easily read, you know, quickly understood. The key facts are at the front. You don't have to wade through a 50-page document because you do not have time to do that type of thing. So um, getting people on uh, into the, the plans uh, to deal with the crisis was paramount to us at that stage, obviously. But um, it's really important to, to remember that you have to test those and test them when you don't expect them. I, I mean, I sort of um, would say this was almost like if you turned up at your house and the door front door is lying open and you know the house has been burgled, you know where to go to look for the things that are most valuable to you. Try turning up at your house, you know it's been burgled, but you can't get in. So you don't know what's missing, you don't know where, you know, what's been taken, you have no idea. And you're standing outside there and you're thinking, where are my records? Where's even my bank account number? What, you know, who's the number to ring? I would defy any CEO to know the their name, number and uh, account details to be able to do such things as freeze bank accounts if that's the thing you have to do. So it's really important to maintain those records out of your system, whether that's on a separate laptop or in a lock safe, it's really, really important. So the situation unfolded, obviously, and there was a lot of challenges that went with it. Um, mainly the, the, the different aspects that you have to deal with, which is the getting the systems back up and running, which was important to me. That was what I really needed. Um, but also, you know, the parallel pieces that have to go with it, which is preserving the evidence for the investigation, especially in this case, when you don't have access to data, that's considered a data breach, and we had to deal with the information commissioners. So you have to preserve that evidence, but at the same time, you can't let things like that hold you back from starting to rebuild your systems or scrub or do whatever it is you have to do to restore. You have all your stakeholders to manage and the projects to make sure that they still have access to business as usual and indeed your own teams and staff to make sure that they've got something to do. And of course the IT team have to be supported to do whatever they have to do. But So we knew what we needed and resources was what we needed, exactly what Roman said. Um, but there was a lot of very, in, in a, a whole very uncertain circumstances, there was a lot of conflicting priorities in terms of um, things that needed done uh, in relation to, such as preserving, you know, you can't preserve evidence while at the same time scrub and restore systems. So you have to work out how to do all, all of that. And one of the things that I probably learned most from this was to manage expectations because, you know, there are numbers in relation to cyber, a ransom um, cyber attack, such as, you know, the National Cyber Security Agencies, PSNI, Cyber, you know, all of those people, Action Fraud 101. And when you're ringing those numbers, you're expecting something to happen. Um, you're expecting a reaction, maybe you're expecting help. 
and that doesn't happen because that's not their job to do. Um, they want to see maybe copies of data to preserve evidence, but you know, um, action fraud in the UK or the sorry, national cyber security in the UK, they couldn't even return our phone call for 48 hours because we're just too small here. Um, but because we're a cross-border body, we also had access to the National Cyber Agency in Ireland. And indeed, they did take copies of our data very quickly and were able to tell us within a couple of days very, very quickly that they couldn't be um, uh, you know, unlocked. So we were able to at least avail of that. Um, and again, because we'd roam in here, you needed you know, you need that trusted advisor on site. He was able to get here fast. He was really brilliant and, and always sent us um, we needed resources, we needed boots on the ground to actually scrub machines and, and Ronan, you know, it was holiday time, people weren't available from a lot of different organisations, but, you know, Ronan was always very careful to say to us, well, I'm going to bring in people that are going to actually be able to help do what you need to do, there's no point in me bringing in highly skilled people to sit and scrub machines. So we were clear what we wanted, we had our priorities, we knew what we, in terms of our IP recovery, what we wanted to do for bringing the systems back online, uh, but in that period of uncertainty, it's, it is difficult, it is challenging, there's no doubt about that. And Ronan, Gina said there about managing expectations, and is that something you find that you and your team have to do alongside the pressure of getting things protected and getting things working again? Yeah, absolutely, Richard. Um, a, a lot of people think that, you know, we can just um, we have a magic wand and, you know, this, this will be fixed in a matter of hours or, or overnight. Unfortunately, malware and ransom attacks usually take a number of weeks, if not months, to, to fully recover from. And, and that's not, you know, that's not scare tactics. That's the reality. If you think about what you need to do here, and Gina, Gina was very clear. She said, Ronan, in managing your expectations, I, I want to make sure that we scrub, recover, and restore whilst at the same time trying to preserve information that would help with an investigation. And, and those things, unfortunately, um, don't necessarily go hand in hand. If you're scrubbing down systems, it is very difficult to restore the data, sorry, to, to um, gather the information that you need to help with the investigation. So you have to strike a fine balance. Um, there's processes and procedures that you can go through that could take weeks and months um, to, to, to try and get you that information that you need. Or you can say, actually, what we're going to do here, if we base this a uh, risk-based decision, we'll run something that will take a couple of hours that will get us 95% of the information that will help us then when it comes to determining what happened um, in the investigation. And that, that's a business decision that needs to be taken. And as I say, Gina was very clear on her priorities and, and said, we need to get the systems back up and running. So we were able to do that. We were able to get the key information preserved and then commence with that scrubbing and restoration exercise. But that in itself isn't you know, the, the be all and end all. You have to manage your key stakeholders. There's the communication piece. So I remember uh, at one stage, uh, there was a request had, had come in that we need to get email systems up and running as a priority. Um, and, and that's important because you want to communicate both internally and externally. Um, but you've got to remember if you run an on-premise email system, it's currently out of action. So you have to think of standing up uh, something perhaps in the cloud or certainly off site. And that's not without its own risks. And you don't have access then to the old emails from the old system. So you're effectively starting afresh. So you have, you have to make those decisions. Um, I think as well, it, there, there's a number of other systems that need to get stood up and the priority of those systems is important. I, I remember Gina saying to me, Ronan, when we, when we start scrubbing down these systems, we need to get the finance system back up and running. Um, that's key, that's a priority for us. But being cognizant, you know, Gina was able to say, we can run some manual processes here, you know, if we absolutely have to. Let's so back, up, back plan, make sure that we can um, continue running into next month if we need to. Um, and I was quick to highlight, Gina, if you're, if you're going down to a manual route, just be careful as well, because you, you'll have to start inputting um, bank details, customer information, perhaps manually, and ask the banks to process that. A lot of a lot of attackers will try um, and exploit that vulnerability. We've seen it a, a number of recent times: um, invoice redirection fraud, where um, members of the finance team receive an email asking them to update bank details um, to the fraudsters' bank details, but it's made very legitimate. So there's a heightened risk there that in trying to 
subvert the process that was currently in place and, and going more manual, that you just need to be aware of that and just be on your guard to make sure you don't fall foul to uh, another scam, uh, which just compounds the crisis that you're currently in. And Ronan, it's all well and good if you have everything in place and you're protected or you think you're protected, but the people behind these attacks will try new ways every time, won't they? Because they're determined to access personal data. So it's a case of you know, companies or organisations that have protection in place, they shouldn't be ashamed in any way that something like this has happened. Yeah, there, there, there's an adage here which, you know, hackers only have to be successful once, but you as an organisation have to be successful all the time. And, and that's the unfortunate realities of it. And, you know, we would often say it's it's not if, but when. And, and the key thing here is about protecting yourself uh, insofar as you can, protecting your key information, protecting your crown jewels, um, and making sure that your staff as well um, are aware and alert of some of the key indicators that may um, be, be be thrust upon them in relation to attackers sending through fake emails, fake links, um, et cetera, trying to convince them to, to click and um, access and download uh, different information to the computers and systems to allow them to have remote access, for example. Um, but yeah, no, it, 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 it's a challenging world attackers will adapt. Gina already alluded to the fact she, she didn't think that they would be susceptible to it, but you know the, the hackers can deploy automated tools and scripts that scan networks and scan the internet looking for vulnerabilities and time is on their side. Uh, you know, that's the thing that, that they absolutely have and they only have to be successful once to get in. And COVID has been an exploit for them? Uh, absolutely. As I said, you know, remote workers, um, you're, you're trying various workarounds to get onto systems. IT teams have probably lowered their guard. Patching that's normally done um, perhaps isn't happening. And the, the attackers are absolutely um, looking to exploit that. Mm -hmm. Gina, the fact that you're, you're here today sharing your story, talking about something which you didn't have to, I mean, Tell us why you've decided to talk about the cyber event that, uh, I mean, your organisation wasn't expecting and you had protections in place as far as you were concerned. Well, I suppose it's because we were lucky. Um, you know, we our project data was safe. It, uh, as it transpired, our data for our staff, which was our data breach as such in terms of not remote access, employee records turned out was safe. Um, wasn't taken and there's no evidence of anything like that. So money wasn't taken. Um, we were able to ensure that our staff were told that day, be vigilant on your bank accounts, maybe change bank account numbers, just in case. You know, it was all these precautionary measures you take. But you do feel very responsible. This is our staff who are in part of this organisation and, you know, they're, they're now all being put at risk. So to me, if there's anything at all that we can do to convince other people to, to raise their standards. You know, we are in a different world. This COVID is, it brings a whole plethora of new risks. And I think people need to go and seriously assess their risks again in this environment. For instance, we, we would have backups. We had backups um, which were taken off site every week. But when COVID started, that stopped. So once we did backups here in magnetic form, we knew that our backups were destroyed and the, they were encrypted in the disks, but we had our backups um, in magnetic form and we were very, very fortunate. But it did take us a couple of days. I mean, the IT team were absolutely quietly confident that they were okay. It's very difficult to jump between mediums. That's a cyber way uh, of talking. Um, but uh, they were very convinced that it was all right. But until I actually saw it for sure, I wanted to make sure it was okay. So there are things that people can do to protect themselves. So what we did in that time, in those couple of days when we weren't sure, well, I wasn't you know, absolutely sure I had my backups, um, sent out a message to all the staff to start doing things like logging the reports that they had been completing in the last three months. So again, you know, it's practical stuff simple things like making sure during COVID you keep your name in conventions, you keep your version control, that you're able to act, you know, have records of systems in case you do need to do that. It's about thinking about things that you've put to the side during COVID that really are so important. And I can't describe enough how difficult it is, as I say, standing looking at 
blank computer screens and not knowing what's happened. Um, and, and also trying to deal with the information commissioner's 72 hour turnaround at the same time. You know, you're trying to write reports, you don't have access to your normal documents that are, are in the system. I mean, these are just simple things that people can do to help protect themselves. And so to me, it's important. We're all in this together. Everybody listening in this conference are here with one aim to protect ourselves. So if I can add some practical measures for people to be able to protect themselves. I'm more than happy to do that because I know we were fortunate and we were fortunate with PwC, we were able to bring them in, we were able to do a call off contract, our departments worked with us, you know, really, really quickly. Some people aren't that fortunate and, and you know, if you start trying to think about procurement and go and trying to find out names of companies to go to in a crisis, um, whenever you're dealing with everything else, it, it's, it, wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be the smartest of moves um, whenever you can actually protect yourself. And the other thing we did... Well, Gina, and sorry, how vital was it having an external team come in? Oh, oh absolutely. It was, it was absolutely vital. As I said, we had a, we had an advisor who, who was really um, sharp on the, the cyber security, and he's an expert. But So he, he had personal contacts, but whenever we got rolling in, you know, to have somebody there who's giving you assurances, telling us, you know, right, next steps, do this, but also giving assurances that what we're doing is right. And that we're, you know, we're doing the right thing, and we're just, you know, keeping progress in the right way because it's really important to, to get those wins. Every little win um, is vital in that first week. Whenever you, literally you're working nearly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and looking after a team, trying to do the same. And I would also just say to anybody um, who's listening that if this does happen, make sure and keep a log. Right, start from right from the minute you, if it's one book, whatever it is, keep a log of what happens because. You, things move so fastly, decisions have to be made. It's important that there's only one decision maker, in this case it was me, but um, decisions have to be made and you have to remember, go back and remember why you made that decision at that time. So it's really practical things that I have no problem sharing with people. We thought we were safe, we thought we had done enough, we clearly hadn't. Um, and, I, and I would imagine that most people, the, the, the criminals are moving faster than us and their expertise is moving faster than us as Roland has outlined. So we just should try to stay as ahead of them as we can. I'll ask you both this question. I'll start with Ronan. Ronan, for anyone watching this, I mean, both personally and in a professional business organization sense, what would your message be uh, in terms of cyber attacks and protecting your organization? Uh, I, I, I guess, Richard, th there's a couple of things that initially spring to mind. One is if you're an organization that is potentially susceptible to a cyber attack. It's making sure that you've run those desktop exercises. It's making sure that you've got um, retainer agreements um, in place with organizations who can help. Like speed is off the essence and um, it, it is important. Gina alluded to the fact here that you know, procurement can take time. If, if you have a trusted advisor who already understands your systems, they can hit the ground running and, and speed is absolutely off the essence. You know, in, this, in this particular case, um, SEUPB had to flatten their entire IT network. That is no small undertaking. And then rebuild all of that. That is a huge challenge. Most of these systems, um, like most organizations, have probably been set up um, years ago and have very little updates, maintenance to them. And those people that have done that have probably moved on. So if, you're, if your current IT team is suddenly tasked with, okay, we now need to rebuild the entire IT infrastructure of this organization, you know, that, that, is, that is very daunting. Have that information, have that knowledge, if you can, in documents stored elsewhere off-site. Have the um, communication channels, have, a, have a, a work stream that you know that if something does happen, uh, you lose emails, you lose mobile phone access, that you have another mechanism by which you can reach all your senior stakeholders um, within, within your organization so that they can all be briefed and they all understand and are all on the same page um, in relation to responding to a cyber attack. Um, Remain calm. It's an ex exceptionally stressful situation. Um, having having to deal with this, as Gina mentioned before, you know, you you don't understand what the attackers have done. Have they taken anything? In, in this case, you know, you have to leave that down to the investigation, which could take some days or weeks to fully understand. And you know, I was pleased to, to see in this instance that there there wasn't any form of data exfiltration. But that you know, 
the, the threats that we're seeing at the minute very, very much do align themselves to um, ransomware and extortion, and they're certainly a lot more sophisticated. So having your guard up and being mindful of that is, is very important. Gina, your organization has come through this, thankfully, and things you're probably feeling a lot better now than you were over the summer when it happened. What would your message be to people out there watching this? Well, I've, I've talked about a lot of the practical things that people can do, and I really would urge them to go and do it as soon as possible. Um, do the simple things. That, I mean, it doesn't cost much money um, to actually just make sure you've got your paper copies, as Roman said, or you have your templates for the ICO or whatever it is, you have them off-site. But to be vigilant and, um, you know, you have to treat this as an insurance policy because uh, you need to put as much as you can into the cyber security uh, as you as you possibly can in your organization. It's too late when it happens. We were very fortunate. We did have the backups. We had what we needed. We were able to get people here to help us. Um, and we had systems restored within five weeks and everything. And people all back and working you know, before that, all systems back by then. So I think it's really important but to remain calm. And I, and I would say that you don't let the psychology of what's happened and the criminals get under your skin because you can only deal with what you know. It's not personal. And when you realize this was probably just a random drive-by, as it's called, um, you know, you think, right, well, okay, then let's just deal with what we've got. But you have to only deal with what you know. You keep your circle tight, you keep your team focused, and you keep them going in the one direction of the one end game, which is to get our systems back up and running. But of course, parallel, you do all of those other bits. But I would just encourage anybody to go and get prepared. And lean on experts because you are not going to be an expert in cybersecurity. Your IT team may not have, you know, um, expertise in cybersecurity to the extent that would be required. So you have to lean on experts. You know, people get paid to do a job that they're um, experts in and use them. Okay, Gina, Ronan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, an important and very timely issue to highlight because more and more of us use technology now to store our personal information and it's relied on around the world and hackers want to try and access this information because data is becoming a valuable commodity so the importance of making sure it's protected we've highlighted it there and how to deal with such a situation because i suppose it would be easy to lose your cool or not stay calm but if you have the right systems in place and you've got the drill in place and you know what to go through should be able to get through such an event.